You're listening to the Truth About Bible Study taught by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Thank you all for coming today. Joining us again for our Sunday School Bible Study. Looking forward to getting into a, an exciting topic once again with you. Um, we've been talking for the last couple weeks about the truth about refugees. And I enjoyed the first week where we got to just kind of discuss it as a group. Last week I gave you just some principles that I think would be helpful to guide our thinking as we look at the Bible. This week we'll continue along that path and then eventually get to the point just where how this, how this whole thing for me personally has impacted myself and I guess leave it up to you to let it impact you however it does. We've discussed what's been called the greatest humanitarian crisis in the history of the world. There are around 60 million people around the world that are refugees currently, 11 million in the country of Syria, and even those 11 million that are left in their homes in Syria are left in very, very difficult situations where there is war going on in just about every city there. It's, it's the whole country is a mess. And so we have discussed some of the reasons behind the civil war, that a lot of it was just the the people rising up and wanting more of a democracy, democratic government. And we've discussed how some of the countries have responded. And certainly we understand this morning that we don't have the ability to choose how Canada or any country responds to this crisis. And so our political opinion is not of a great deal of value. But I think as Christians, we have a duty to understand what the Bible says and how, as Christians, we ought to be responding when we get a a chance personally to respond to somebody who is a refugee or how we think about this whole thing and how we discuss it with people. And I think a lot of times our attitudes are very evident in just our discussions. And so that's why I thought it was important to talk about. Let's pray and then we'll get into the lesson today. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. I thank you that you love sinners, that you sent your son um, to come to this earth, to a foreign land, to come to save us, um, to die to redeem us, and to make us your people. And so, God, I pray that as we look to the Bible this morning, you'd help us to look at it as your people um, with obedient hearts to your word. Um, And Lord, I know that there is so much to be said about this and, and I know that my understanding is limited, as is all of ours, Lord. And so I pray that you would just shed some light upon this situation with your word um, today for us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We discussed last week that the goal is for us to be able to come to a biblical opinion on this subject, but that also it's very possible for people to, to attempt to Um, study the Word of God and to get into the Word of God and to form an opinion and have those people form different differing opinions. That is a possible thing. And so we we leave that open to that. But what I found interesting is I think that sometimes we come to subjects like this and we don't think, we don't purposefully think biblically about them, right? Sometimes we respond with our just natural gut reaction. Sometimes we respond based on statements from other Christian leaders. Um, Sometimes it's um, the opinions of others. Sometimes it's the propaganda we've seen. We're impacted by that, or certainly we're all impacted by the sensational news media that uh, we're bombarded with all the time. Um, Sometimes it's party lines. So we we have all these things that are playing a part in the way we think about this. Uh, Lifeway Research did a study recently, and they found that only 12% of those who identify as evangelical Christians say that their views on refugees and immigration issues are primarily influenced by their faith. So 12% said that that it was primarily their faith that is influencing how they think about the subject. It's a very low number. They also said that only one in five evangelicals has ever heard a biblical message or teaching about refugees or other immigrants. That's not very high either. And so there is part of, there's, there's, I guess, a reason why there's not too many Christians that are trying to think biblically about this because there's not a whole lot of Christians talking biblically about this. So, obviously the goal is just to, to say, okay, here's the issue, here's the subject, what does the Bible say? 
If all I accomplish is for you to go back to the Bible and then reaffirm your position, then I'm okay with that. That's great. But I think we should all be open to be ch- being challenged by the Bible as well. Alistair Begg says, um, whenever he makes a controversial point, he says, but you are res- reasonable people, study this for yourselves. Now, that's kind of my attitude. You're reasonable people, so study this for yourselves. Last week we looked at the first seven principles to guide our thinking. Number one was that Christians and governments have differing responsibilities and duties. I think it's very obvious, but it's important to point out that governments have a different duty than citizens do, than Christians do. Number two was that God's command for Israel to overthrow sinful nations has no bearing on this situation. It's not the same thing. It's not apples to apples. Number three was that God commanded Israel to love the stranger because they were once strangers. So the Bible does command on a number of occasions that Israel welcome and love and feed and clothe and take care of the strangers. The Bible also, within that, tells them that they should expect the strangers to obey their laws. And I think that's that's very reasonable as well. Number four is that God often used sinful nations to judge his own people. There's a lot of times that Israel is judged by other nations and God, God allows those nations to rise up against Israel for their judgment. It doesn't mean that that nation wasn't more sinful. Maybe they were. A lot of times Israel, when they go into a land, it's because God is judging that nation. And so God uses different nations to judge one another. And just the point is that if, if ultimately our concern is that someday our land might be judged and God might use Um, the Muslim people to do that, then we shouldn't be afraid of that. That should be something that we are okay with God doing. It's not something I want to stand in God's way if he's judging. I think that our job as Christians is just obedience. Obedience to the principles of the Bible, obedience to God's command, obedience to what he wants us to do, first and foremost. Number five, God loves Muslims, even terrorists, as much as he loves Dutch people. (laughs) true i know i know it's hard to believe because you look at a dutch person you're like how can god not love that person more (laughs) he doesn't Um, and this is clearly seen in the life of the apostle paul number six christians are citizens of heaven first and the point of that is just to remember that the kingdom we are interested in building the kingdom that we work for is the kingdom of god it's the kingdom of heaven it's not the kingdom of canada It's not the kingdom of the United States. It's not the kingdom of of any country. We work for his kingdom. And if we ever have the opportunity to use our citizenship to build his kingdom, our citizenship on this earth, to build his kingdom, that's what it's for. But recognize that one is subordinate to the other. They're not competing kingdoms, right? Number six, number seven, that God is in control at all times and often uses evil people to purify and judge his own people. We kind of covered that part already, but the fact that God is in control at all times is something that we must always remember. It is very easy to look at current events and become terrified of what's going on. You can go to one news story after another, after another, after another, that for 50 different reasons tell you why the world's going to end tomorrow, right? Trump is going to do something insane, or the climate's going to collapse, or terrorists are going to bomb us, or whatever it is in we're always going to die. That's that's kind of like the sensational news media out there right now. And we need to remember that God is in control at all times, that there's nothing that's happening that's outside of his purview, okay? That he is not, he's not scared of Muslims. Um, Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turns it whithersoever he will. And the idea there is that just like nature is in his hands, the king's heart is in his hands, okay? There's nothing that a king can do that God doesn't allow. When Jesus was speaking to Pilate, we saw that he said, you could have no power over me, against me, except it were given thee from above. God gave Pilate the power to crucify Jesus. And Jesus recognized that. And when we go through difficulty, I think it's helpful to recognize that God has given that person or this nation or whatever it is, the power to do that. That's, this is obviously a part of his sovereign plan. He is sovereign over nature. He is sovereign over nations. He is sovereign over Satan. 
Um, I heard it said once that Satan is on a leash and God holds the reins. And that is obviously clear in the book of Job. So, God is in control at all times. Number eight, Jesus was a refugee. Now, this might seem like a, a moot point that it's really not has anything to do with anything. Um, but it is maybe helpful to remember that Jesus himself was a refugee when he fled with his parents to Egypt to escape Herod, who was trying to kill him. This is kind of what a refugee is. They're, they're fleeing one place because their lives are in danger to seek safety in another nation. So Jesus can identify with refugees. But it's not just to say that because Jesus was a refugee, we should care for every refugee in the world. Okay, we do recognize the government still has a duty to use wisdom to protect. But it is to say that sometimes families are forced out of their homes through no fault of their own. And within all of this, what we don't want to ever do is start to brand, to have the face of a terrorist on every refugee, right? Of the vast majority of refugees, the vast, vast majority of refugees are not coming to any country seeking to do ill to that country. They're coming to the country. They have to leave their country. They don't want to. They have to leave their homes because it was bombed. They, they can't stay where they are. They, it would just be like you having to leave most of your possessions behind and, and flee to get out of this country. If that happened, that would be devastating for you. It wouldn't be a, a positive thing. It wouldn't be your chance to infiltrate another country. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that, that people don't come with their own ideals and philosophies and that that's not going to impact our place, our, our country. But I, I am saying that recognize that, that the vast majority of them, they don't have some type of evil motive in having to leave their country, right? They're being forced out by evil people. Number nine. We are called to love our neighbor. We are called to love our neighbor. Um, In Luke chapter 10, verses 29 to 36, we find the parable of the Good Samaritan. Parable goes, But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? So here here is a person who is attempting to say, Yeah, but who really is my neighbor? I mean, who am I actually supposed to love? Who am I supposed to care for? It's an excellent question. Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, and when he, when he was at that place, came and looked upon him and passed by on the other side. Now, this is significant just because these two men, they worked in the temple. They were servants of God. That was their job. That was their duty. They weren't just your average plumber or electrician. They were the guy that was bound by his life, by his profession to serve God. That's what he did. And these two guys see this man and they pass by on the other side. And and Jesus here, recognize, he's speaking this parable with the idea of religious Pharisees in mind, that they're there and they're listening. And he's saying, listen, the religious folks, they they were the ones that just passed by. Okay. He goes on and says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he had departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? So now you have these two religious people who passed by, a Jew. I mean, they pass by their own kind. They pass by someone that they should have identified with. Nothing to do with them. And a Samaritan comes, and if you know the history of of Israel and Samaria, you know that the Samaritans were considered half-breeds. They're the ones that sold out and and married other nations and um, started their own temple and their own offerings. And so they they kind of had their own religious system that in some ways um, resembled or mirrored the system of the Jews. 
but they were doing it all wrong. I mean, they were doing it contrary to what the Bible said. And so the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. And we're not just talking like they're just rivals when they play hockey together. We're talking like utter hatred between these people. And yet, the Samaritan comes and sees someone in need, and he binds up his wounds, and he takes care of them, and then he brings them to, to where he was going, and he puts them in a hotel, and he tells the, the owner to take care of him and bind him up, and whatever, whatever cost you have that I haven't given you enough money for yet, I'll repay you when I get back. Okay? Just overboard to help this person. He didn't know who was his enemy. So the call to love our neighbor, I think, is relevant. Um, in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, we are told that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. The whole Bible, the whole law, all of God's commands rest on these two things. Love God, love your neighbor. So if we have two guiding principles, when we're thinking about any situation, they should start with these two. In this situation, how do I love God and love my neighbor? Okay, that's a very important question. Now, you could bring up, and I think you should bring up, well, I also have neighbors that live beside me. And so if I'm loving them properly, I also don't want to let just a whole bunch of thieves and murderers into the country because I got to love that person too, and I recognize that. So, but we do need to think about this. How much risk is, is worth it for people who are fleeing their country and have no place to go. We, we have to think these things through, okay? And loving your neighbor includes them and it includes our literal neighbors. We can't forget of, about either group of people, okay? Number 10, God has used terrorism in the past to further reach, to further the reach of the gospel. God has used terrorism in the past to further reach the gospel. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it's amazing here to me because we think of Paul as the greatest missionary of all time, right? And it's, it, it's true. He is. He was. But one thing is interesting is when he was being entirely, completely evil, he was contributing to missions. That's just God showing that he can use Paul this way or he can use Paul this way. That's what God does, right? Acts chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul was consenting to his death. This is the death of Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Okay, now when it's talking about persecution at the church, it, that, what's happening there is named elsewhere. It's terrorism. Okay? It's, it's going in and ripping families apart and killing some and stoning some to death and putting others in prison and, and leaving kids. I mean, like, it's brutal. It wasn't a nice place. And so this persecution is serious enough that they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So God used this terrorism to scatter them to Judea and to Samaria. The apostles stayed, but many, many Christians fled and brought the gospel with them. And next thing you know, in the book of Acts, we have churches in Judea and Samaria. Then Paul speaks in Acts chapter 17, and he says in Acts 17, verses 26 and 27, and hath, and this is speaking of God, so he's telling, he's telling unbelievers what God has done, says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So God has determined where people will live, what borders they'll be in and, and where they are at any given time. He's determined that. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Okay. So this is why the solution to everything isn't, well, let's just bring everybody to Canada. But it's also recognizing that there are times that people get driven from where they're at, and we'd say, God is determining their times before appointed. He's determining where they should live. Okay, now, right now they're up in the air, but, but God, he's sovereign over that. Right? He's working in that and through that. So <clears throat> now we have Muslims who have lived in closed countries. Christians really had a lot of difficulty to try and reach with the gospel, most of whom have never heard the gospel of Jesus once. They've heard his name, but a completely different person being described. That's their situation. And now they're coming to a country where we can freely preach the gospel to them. We should not fail to recognize that there is gospel opportunity here. There is an opportunity to reach people with the gospel that before were unreached, that couldn't be reached. 
So maybe we should be thinking about how we take the opportunities and maybe, maybe think, you know what? God is sovereign over this. And God has used terrorism in the past to further the reach of the gospel. He might use terrorism in the future to further the reach of the gospel. He might use war. He might use very terrible things this side of heaven so that, so that some people will be able to know the gospel and trust him and be saved for eternity because that's more important than their safety at this moment. Um, I find God always uses strange events for his cause. Absolutely. Which means we couldn't have planned this. It wasn't our idea. It was ultimately God's idea. So the little story I have with that is he was Nico a lot. He has a Muslim friend. Mm-hmm. And he comes over one, oh, quite a bit, actually. Mm-hmm. And we get to know him, less than I. And every once in a while, because we're befriending him, we get into a little conversation. Mm-hmm. But it's pleasant. It's good. And he walks away going, hmm. But, and eventually, I'll bring Christ into it. And I'll start with other means. But it's just a neat way that Nico has a relationship with a Muslim friend. Yep. And eventually, somehow, some way, He's getting the gospel. Yeah. So we, actually, he's come once. Here. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 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 He's yeah. I remember meeting him. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's pretty neat. I, I know that uh, when we went to Harvesters to visit the camp, um, they had a kid there that was a Muslim, and I asked John Vink about him, and John said, "Well, his parents don't know that he's coming. <laughs> he just says he's going to a friend's house." And, <laughs> Really? You're like, I feel like that's not okay. <laughs> but the kid is really like just soaking it up. And, and just so you know, there are like thousands of stories of Muslims coming to Christ. It's not like this isn't happening and Muslims just can't be saved. There are so many stories of people that are trapped in a religion of, of laws and rules and that they're bound and they see freedom in Christ and they want it. Okay, Not all that you talk to will be like that. And most will take... A conversation will take um, a relationship, but there are a lot of people coming to Christ, okay? And so this, this crisis, and it is a crisis, God is still working through it, and we're seeing good accomplished. So God has used tares in the past, and he will in the future. Number 11, we have a call to feed, water, house, clothe, care for, visit, and help the poor. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we that thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it to the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now, this is a call, I think, to ensure that when we see people who are hurting, who are suffering, who are difficult, who are hungry, who are thirsty, who are um, naked or without home or in prison or sick, we should go to them. Okay? Now, I, will, I, mean, I, I see in this passage that Jesus clearly says, the least of my brethren. So he, he isn't necessarily speaking about the entire world here. Okay, he, he does say, you've done it to the least of my brethren, which means that there is a priority, I think, given to the children of God here. And, and so, at the very least, this is a call to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are refugees, at the very least. Um, it might be more, and I think ultimately when we see the relationship between the church and the world and Christians in the world, we see that um, we are to do good to all men, but especially to the church. It doesn't, it does, it's not the idea that we don't do good to the world. It means that it starts here, and eventually it needs to go out into the community. It needs to go out into the world, but it starts here. Um, but it's also good for us to recognize we don't have the numbers in Canada, but in the United States, 43% of um, refugees that have been admitted into the United States thus far this year, which is a total of 33,000, are Christians, identify as, as Christians. So that's 43%. That's a pretty high number. 
Um, Muslims aren't that high. There's other faiths that are higher. So Christians are the number one religion being welcomed into the United States at the moment. We don't have the numbers for Canada. Um, and it, it might be very different here. But that is, that is the case. Um, in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13, it says, Whoso stops his ear at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself and shall not be heard. And I think we ought to remember, and I know that the gospel is always the priority. It has to remain the priority. Okay? The preaching and teaching of the gospel. We, we need to be most concerned about eternal destinies. However, the Bible also calls us constantly to care for people's needs. And we cannot divorce those two things. We need to keep one a priority, the priority, but we need to do both. Number Yes, Pastor. I just think along that thought is that that's exactly what Jesus did. Yeah. I mean, he came preaching and teaching, but when people were hungry, he fed them. Absolutely. You, know, you can't divorce the two. Yep. And I think sometimes we try to do that. Either we, we say we're going to give them the gospel, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And that's really bad. Mm-hmm. If we can keep people up, people. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and the danger on the other side, and we've seen that too before, is that you go in and you feed people and you, you give them a house and you do everything for them and you never really get a, a clear presentation of the gospel. And, and sadly, you can raise money a lot easier for those endeavors than you can for the gospel preaching endeavors. That's why the church has to be so careful that, that that's our priority, but we do both. Yeah, I'm not going to speak myself, but our church is that sponsor refugees. And that's actually quick in your uh, face to work, right? Yep. There. Some churches are in better position than the others. Yep. The guy, uh, the man worked for us, was very difficult because of the language there, but that I got to give him credit for that. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, a friend of mine, Justin Fink, goes to a church, and it's, it's a little bit more of a liberal church um, in Calgary, but he told me that his church sponsors two refugee families. And so I said, well, what does that exac- exactly look like for you in your church? He said, well, what what happens is we have like a lady in our church that works at the church and um, she's in charge of kind of t- overseeing the process. And she um, has different people in the church who go and meet with the kids to tutor them, to help them to learn English and to, to do those kind of things. She has another group that will go and like walk the parents through a grocery store just to, a and, and, yeah, and teach them how to like how buying food in Canada works and, and what foods are healthy and what aren't. And like just trying to, trying to walk this family along. And so the church is incredibly involved in the lives of these people. They were the ones that met them at the airport and had coats for them to pick them up and brought them home. And yeah, and so and they're the ones that helped them find or, or maybe even found a place for them to live for a while. Um, got them beds, got them. Yeah, I know all about that. I went through it more, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. But let's not, let's not forget of this part too. I think that, the world around us obviously is looking at the church and looking at how we talk and think and respond to this as well. And when you look at, say, just the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? What kind of testimony was the priest and the Levite for, for Judaism? Terrible, right? Just pff, nothing to do with it. And there was a Samaritan that was a great testimony for the Samaritan religion, which was false. I'm going to say the Levite and the priest went by because they were going to the temple. They were on a pilgrimage, and they were going to serve in that temple. Mm -hmm. And they were not allowed to touch anything unclean. So their purpose was, they were looking here, my purpose is to serve Mm -hmm. in the temple. Now, where they're wrong is, what does the Lord want? Does he want sacrifice, or does he want Mm -hmm. kindness? So don't be really hard on them. Because they're bound in tradition, just like all... That, you're right. You're right there. Um, that, that is absolutely true. Uh, and and it's, it's likely if we were to meet the priest and the Levite, we, we demonize them. It's likely if we were to meet with those guys, we'd be like, you're not so bad. <laughs> kind of like you. <laughs> you know. I, so that's a good point. But, but still, they were the ones that were the, the bad testimony, right? They were the ones that, to the world watching really didn't have a whole lot of good. And so when we think about this too, I, you know, I, I imagine that church is doing this. It represents, um, people think well of them. Now, that's not always our goal, right? And we can't just do things so people think well of us. But um, I don't know, maybe it's a consideration there. Okay, number 12, the call to love our enemy. We have been called to love our enemy. Romans 12, verses 19 to 21 says, Dearly beloved, 
Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. And when I think of this verse, I do think of the fact that, that Christians might have good cause to hate, to despise um, s- some people in this religion. Okay? There, I mean, there's been a lot of hurt, a lot of death, a lot of violence caused by Muslims in the name of Allah. And so there is cause to want to avenge. And he says, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. And, and again, I, I think that this verse is really like, I know how you feel. I know what you want to do. But recognize that the best thing for you to do is to be obedient to God. And if you're obedient to God and they, they hurt you still and they don't respond to the grace that they're receiving, well, then you're heaping coals of fire in their head. It's, go- it's going to be worse for them. God's going to take care of it. So you don't have to worry about justice because justice will be served. But it's similar to the story of Jonah not wanting to go to Nineveh, right? He was, he was afraid to go to Nineveh. Why did he not want to go to preach to Nineveh? Because he didn't want them to repent because he knew God's mercy. He knew God's grace. But if, if Jonah would have went to Nineveh and they wouldn't have repented, then God would have judged them. Jonah would have been happy too. <laughs> he, he would have been happy. And there are times, and there, I believe there will be a time where we sit with the Lord in heaven or, or, or whatever it is, and we see justice being served and it feels right. It feels good. That there will be time that we see blood spilt because those people deserved it right? I think that will happen. I believe that will happen. But it's not for us to do that. It's, it's for us to actually help and to show grace and to do our best. So, call to love our enemy. Uh, Matthew five forty four. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them which curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. The only people we love are the ones that are just like us. The, I mean, what are we doing? How is that demonstrating that we've been transformed? That, that we have the love of God who sacrificed himself for sinners in us. One more, Matthew 5, verses 10 and 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay? If we do what we're called to do, then here the promise is, if you do what's right to those people, if you love them, if you share the gospel, if you do all those things, then you are blessed and you can rejoice in being exceedingly glad even in the midst of your persecution because you know that there is a reward in heaven waiting for you. That God is the one who will mete out the justice and he will mete out the just rewards as well. And he's good. And he's watching us. He's watching our hearts. He's watching how we respond. He's watching how we talk. And all of these things are being recorded, right? We stand before him one day. And I think that, that in this situation and in every situation, what we must do is say, God, what do you want me to do? And act on that. And if you disagree with me and you disagree with me because you say you think God wants you to do this, then do what God wants you to do, okay? But that's the goal. Number 13 We have a call to respond in faith rather than fear. The book of Hebrews is, uh, chapter 11 is the hall of faith. And there we have wonderful stories of of godly men and a couple women who just were incredible servants, did unbelievable things. But when you look at a lot of their stories, what you find is that not all of them had happy endings. And at the end of book, end of chapter 11, he actually says that there were many who were son asunder, that who, who went through all of these tribulations and difficulties and never saw the end, never saw the promise fulfilled. Okay, now they did now. 
Now in heaven, they'll see it. They, they're there. But this side of heaven, it, it never turned out. And this is what he says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So they see the promises. This is what God says. They believe, they're persuaded, they believe them to be true. They embrace them. In other words, they, they, they begin to apply them to their lives and they confess them. They pronounce them. This is, the, the, this is what faith is supposed to do, right? This is what faith looks like. See truth, believe it, change my life based upon it, and tell others about it. Verse 11. But now they, de- sorry, verse 16. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly... Oh, I got the same verse twice. Okay. So, they were desiring something that was better. Their eyes were not here. Not now. It was on the heavenly kingdom. It was on um, the Lord. And so that's why they acted the way that they did in faith. Um, David Platt wrote an article. I think he actually preached a sermon that was turned into an article on um, refugees at Southern Seminary. And he said, I, and, and he, went, he went overseas. He went kind of to the borders of Syria, some of those countries. He saw the refugee camps. And so this was his, what he talked about. He said, I spoke to normal people with normal lives, professors, engineers, doctors, all of them forced to flee across Turkey where they were exploited every step of the way. To cross the Aegean Sea, they paid an exorbitant sum for a spot on a raft designed to hold 20 people. The raft slowed under the weight of 60. The destination wasn't much relief. A camp built for 2,000, jam-packed with more than 15,000 refugees, huddled up in their makeshift tents. And he goes on and he describes what what that all looked like. And he, he described it as hell on earth. And this was his conclusion. He said, much of our response to the refugee crisis seems to come from a foundation of fear, not faith. Much of it seems to flow from a view of the world that is far more American than biblical, far more concerned with the preservation of our country than the accomplishment of the Great Commission. So recognize that as we talk about these things and as we as we live out our lives, um, we also are living them out in front of another generation. And our children and the younger folks in this church are seeing how we respond to these things. Do we want to teach them that they should respond in faith, trusting God that he is sovereign and that whatever happens is, is his plan and it's good? Or do we want to set an example of, of faith? Wait, of fear. That was the other, of fear. <laughs> Do you want to go faith or faith? <laughs> Those are your only options today. <laughs> um. uh, Dan? Yeah. I think, you know, the love our neighbor, there's got to be boundaries in that too. Mm-hmm. I can have a neighbor that I wouldn't want my kids to go over to their house because I know certain things and problems like that. So I think I loving know. our neighbor, it, it doesn't make us unspiritual yep. if we use caution in that love. Mm-hmm. And I think... You know, this is a new thing happening in the mm-hmm. world today. So I think there's a caution there that we need to question whether we're being chastised by God. But a woman that's being abused by her husband, we can't say, well, she's being chastised by God because, you know, she's yep. being... We need to really examine their motives. And, and I'm sure the, the percentage is way down, but betting, I think, is good. Well, absolutely. I, I know that uh, they're coming into countries without any paperwork at all. So I think yep. that's a problem. But yep. I think we should be loving and compassionate. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I agree with you entirely. I, I, I do think that we need to be cautious, and I completely agree with your story that there's a lot of people, I mean, you don't want to send your kids to a place that you know that it's just bad things going on. Now, with your kids, part of it is you're trying to, um, teach them and raise them so that they get to the point where they can deal with those things themselves, right? Yeah, but I'd, I'd also, I'd pray for my neighbors in front of the kids. Say, hey, you know, mm-hmm. you're not going to know the because, but mm-hmm. let's pray for them. Mm-hmm. I think that's where... But it's not that you never want your kids to engage with people like that. So part of it is that your children are at our, our place right now in their lives where they're, they're more vulnerable. And you've got to protect what's vulnerable. But 
we can't live our entire lives completely risk averse. Like there are, there are going to be risks that happen no matter what we do. It, we, don't, we don't get to make the decisions anyway. But no matter what decisions we make, we, we have to be wise and say, how do I obey and do what I'm called to do and at the same time not do something that's foolish? Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. I think in the middle, you know, in order to, if possible, even peaceably, that, mm-hmm. that means there's an if in there. Yep. But I like the story of the, the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. Mm-hmm. And the five said, no, mm-hmm. you're not taking my oil. Mm-hmm. I don't have enough for you. Mm-hmm. And really, they said, too bad. Mm-hmm. Too bad for you. You, you, you forgot or you, yeah. or you, you didn't bring enough oil. Yeah. And you're not having money. And there's a sense of global socialism where does America owe their prosperity to the world? Mm-hmm. And that's what Trump is arguing mm-hmm. right now. And mm-hmm. he just said the other day, Thursday, America doesn't have a global flag. They have an American flag. Mm-hmm. His job is to protect America, mm-hmm. not the globe. Yep. So there's a balance. And I do agree that, that the government's job is to protect their people. Um, the place, I guess, in that, in that um, parable that we should, I mean, that's kind of scary to say, I guess, is the, the, the five foolish versions were the ones that used their oil when they shouldn't have. They burned it all up. And the five wise ones were the ones that saved it for when they needed it. Right? And so... They had, I think they saved it though, right? Not, that parable, I think they saved their oil so that they could use it when it was needed. So they didn't, basically they didn't waste. Um, and so they had the amount of oil that they needed for the time that was necessary, that, that they needed oil. And if we're talking about just what we need and what we have, we probably have a whole lot more than what we need in Canada and America. If, if it is about need, um, we have a lot of oil to give until we're at the point where... So. Yeah, just, I'm going I'm to leave in a second so I'm going to say something and then leave. It's yeah. always cool. Um, it's great. <laughs> I think one of the great things about all of this is as we sit here, um, the Word of God always challenges us on what we think, what we believe, what our priorities are, what we fear, what's ingrained in us that probably shouldn't be there. And this is a really good exercise to step back a little bit and say beyond the Americanism or the Canadianism or whatever, what is God speaking to my heart about? Because there are things in there that he is, the word of God will confront. Yep. And that's when we have this moment to think, yeah, I know what the Bible says, but, mm-hmm. or this is what the Bible says, and my, my thinking now has come in line with that. And mm-hmm. I think for issues like this, it's so easy to go on autopilot and do what we always do mm-hmm. or what we've heard and not step back for a minute and say, okay, wait a minute. When the rubber meets the road and the word of God confronts me about my selfishness or my fear or my love or my compassion, where am I on this mm-hmm. and what am I supposed to be doing about it? Mm-hmm. And I think for all of us as we sit here, um, that might be something to consider. God bless you. Amen. I'll see you later. All right. See you in church. All right. <laughs> when he's gone, we'll correct everything. No. <laughs> that, that was fantastic. Huh? No, that was, that was right on. I, I absolutely agree. And, and, and you know what, like when I, when I think about this, if, if you want to know like my thought on protection, um, I, I think that the statistics don't show that we're in terrible, a terrible state because of the refugees that we've let in. But when we look at the per capita between us and between Canada and between some of the countries that are in trouble, we see that they're letting in like tons more per capita than we are. So, so we, they, maybe they've been unwise or government has been wise maybe we're being too wise, <laughs> not too wise, but um, that, that's, that, is, that is a possibility, right? So we have to let the government, one of the things I think we, we need to do and that our government should do is ensure that the laws of our land are kept. And I think that is incredibly important. And maybe if there's money to be put into something, then it could be put into ensuring that our police forces, that, are, that, those, that, that the vetting, that all of those things have everything that they need to do the best job they can. So what would the job about the Christian be, though, to, to implement those things as far as, I mean, I, like, I think the first point or something was something about, like, government and how you let yeah. government run government, but then, like, do we, how do we... Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, th- I think that for us, our, prim- our primary response to this isn't going to be involved in that. Um, we, when we get the opportunity to, by vote cast our ballot for who we think stands closest to us on this issue and others, 
I think that's when we get a chance to speak. Um, wh when people ask us, we have an opportunity to, to tell them what we think, but um, we're not going to change what Trudeau is doing because we have an opinion. I, I think that we need to focus on... So I, I was giving my opinion. This is what I think that they should do. They're not going to listen to me. They don't care what I just said. That opinion was just wasted on you because <laughs> they don't care a whole lot about any of us, right? Um, but if we get a chance, maybe we, we get to speak to someone. I don't know. I think the bulk of our response is going to be how are we treating Muslims in our communities? And is there anything that we ought to be doing beyond what we're currently doing for them? That's, I think, how the bulk of our response. Uh, I would love it if the end result of all of this is that just every person saw that they have an absolute duty to love and share the gospel with Muslim people. If that's where we got. I'd be really happy with that. Yeah, and there's other people too besides, I know the Muslims are not great, but there's other people using the church too to bring in people into this country. Yep. The guy in week yep. there, he's a top of the king, right at the top of the brass of the boat club. Yep. And uh, he's bringing in dope through the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not a good idea either. No, it's not. Any better than what the Muslims are doing and anybody else in the country. No, no you're right. There's evil people all over the place. They run with me yeah. across the border and stuff. Yeah. But I'm just saying, it's not just mm -hmm. one individual. It's a lot of people involved in this world. If you look at any um, Christian television station you're going to find a lot of people that are taking advantage of the church and being a terrible testimony to the ca cause of Christ. Yeah, and that's evil. Dan? I think part of the confusion and what makes this such a weird situation is that in our culture today, like we have reversed the roles. The government right now is acting with the arm of charity, and the church is now forced into a position of protection. Right? We want to the government do its job so that we can do our job. Mm -hmm. It should be the church reaching out, looking to bring Muslims or refugees in, mm -hmm. and it should be the government that's putting the proper vetting and, and yep. cautions on mm -hmm. that activity. And yep. it's, it's like totally reversed right now. And yep. I mean, yeah, I think though that the church doesn't stop doing our job if the government stops doing their job. Mm -hmm. And I think that that whether or not the government is doing a good job is up for grabs. I don't think that's a settled debate. Great, but the like, natural, fundamental mm -hmm. principle of the government... Yeah, yeah, right, is, is, is to protect, yes. ...reversal and confusion yes. and not knowing what we should do. Yep, yep. Yeah, it just yeah, the yeah. Whole. yep, it does. In our country, Canada, we're a democracy. Is it our fault? that the government is in one place and Christians or other, when we can elect people, we have the freedom to elect Christians if they run, you know, should we be more involved in the government? Um, I, mean, I mean, we have, we can be, part, uh, participate in yeah. government as far as we want to go, you yeah. know, as, as yeah. long as we get to go. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, yeah. There's an opportunity where in the Bible times, I don't think there is any opportunity for no. anybody to get Government. Right. Okay, so that's there's probably a long answer to that, but I'll, really quickly, um, when the government got when the church got very involved in the government, the church didn't do well. Um, the the three hundred to about twelve hundred, just increasing amounts of power in government to the point where it's the pope that's ruling the world, not the kings. That wasn't a good time for Christianity. Like Christianity didn't flourish because Christ, because Christians were in charge of the government. Um, I do think that. Christians who hold political office and are trying to serve the Lord there are doing a fantastic job, and I'm, and I'm glad for them. And, and I think what John Newton said to William Wilberforce, that he should stay in politics and serve God where he is, is apropos. It's a, good, it's a great thing to do. Um, but I don't know that we can say that it's a, the, the, the fault of the Christians or anyone in particular that the government's doing what they're doing. If all the Christians in Canada voted one way and everybody else voted a different way, we'd still lose. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're out of time. Very out of time. The last point was God will set everything right in the end. Just read Rome, Revelation chapter 16 verses 5 to 6 on your own and be glad to know that God is in control and that he will set everything right. Thank you. <laughs>